Kravtsov. Hello to our viewers and welcome to another edition of IISS video series. I'm especially pleased today to welcome to our studio Major General Gilshon Akoyen. General Akoyen served for over 40 years in the IDF, retiring in 2015. Since then, he's been active in the public sphere, promoting Israel's strategic and security interests. And in, within this framework, I'm happy to say that he's also a research associate with IISS, the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies. General Cohen, welcome. Thank you. I would like to touch on two issues in this uh, short video. One is the significance of territory, the military and security significance of territory in the modern era. And secondly, the question of which, which I find always very enigmatic is why so many senior uh, military personnel and security personnel uh, seem to be in favor of territorial concessions in promoting Israel's efforts to attain peace and security? These two questions are really combined and uh, will just uh, relate to each one uh, differently, but uh, we must remember that uh, they are, to begin with, combined, but we will begin with the question uh, regarding the territory. The very idea that territory is irrelevant in the new modern warfare is a kind of manipulation, not really studying the new changes of a postmodern warfare. Speaking about modern warfare and postmodern warfare is very, very important. Um, the main example of modern warfare is Second World War. 67 war of Israel and the all Arab states was a kind of side effect of Second World War with the same weapons, the same doctrine, and a lot of essential changes occurred since that time. One of the main differences from the era of uh, the 20th century to the 21st century is the fact that today small groups uh, that are even not a state military institution, not state actors, could really create a strategic threat because everyone can buy or produce rockets, mortars, bombs uh, on the sides of the roads. IEDs. Yes, by that to create a strategic problem. Just take, for example, 9-11. It was made and fulfilled by several uh, actors, not at all belonging to a state and of course, the impact was strategic. And then we can ask about the necessity of territory. The idea that we need territory is very well analyzed regarding the maneuvering offensive uh, potential of the last century with armor divisions and uh, artillery, aircrafts. This threat is still existing. The Syrian army that collapsed in the last eight years of civil warfare uh, really trying to resurrect itself. Yeah. And in a, they are entering to a reconstruction with conventional weapons. The warfare in Donetsk, for example, is a combined effort with weapons from 1950s on the ground and support of the Russians, by cyber and other uh, means of uh, in the new warfare of 21st century, and they are combined. It means we cannot say that due to changes that we are facing today, rockets and uh, cyber warfare, it means that territory is irrelevant anymore because they are not isolated. They are coming with uh, all uh, the assets of what was the threat of the last century, and they are combined. Well, I should imagine you know, what a serious situation Israel would be facing today if instead of the IDF being on the Golan, 
you had uh, Hezbollah or some other Iranian affiliates overlooking the Kinneret in the northern Galilee. Of course. It means that if we are analyzing the northern front, and I'm analyzing the logic and the transformational uh, change that was led by Hezbollah, they really succeeded to create a new logic of warfare, but still it, was, it is based upon the basic principles of old Soviet uh, doctrine with three main factors. One, huge defensive capabilities that will really make hard for the Israelis to penetrate toward Lebanon or toward Syria. The second is a lot of rockets that could attack every uh, target in Israel with precision. It means that they can attack strategic assets of Israel, like power stations and, of course, airfields of the IDF, headquarters, with precision and with a lot of masses. Just think that in 2006, we succeeded in a preemptive strike to take the uh, medium and long-range Rackets of them. 2006 or seven, the Second the Lebanese second War. Second Lebanese War. And it was a great achievement of uh, IDF Air Force and intelligence that we succeeded with that preemptive uh, strike. But today, imagine that they have more than 150,000 rockets. And if we are succeeding to attack in preemptive uh, strike, 80%, it's a great achievement. Yet, what remains. The 20% is, is very dangerous. It is great. A strategic uh, danger to Israel that could destroy civilian centers, could destroy headquarters. But how does this relate to the significance of territory? No, the territory is, is so important because, first of all, speaking about the enemy, the territory defending the assets of the enemy. How? Because the, the missiles and rockets are spread in all Lebanon and in the depths of Syrian territory. It means that we can uh, penetrate to Lebanon, coming to Beirut, and still, if they are launching rockets from the North Pka or from Syria uh, to Tel Aviv, they are still creating a great uh, disaster to the daily life in Tel Aviv that the negotiation about the uh, ceasefire agreement will begin from inferiority of Israel. And it, this is due to the territory. As long as they are uh, just exploiting the depths of their territory, it is a kind of prevention, what is called anti-access, that making the Israeli uh, classical capabilities, classical uh, conventional warfare capabilities, to find themselves irrelevant, because this is exactly what they are trying to do. They are not trying to conquest Tel Aviv. What they are trying is to take the enormous capabilities of IDF and to exemplify them as irrelevant to uh, give security to the people of Israel. And how, how does this relate to the significance of territory for Israel and perhaps with specific uh, uh, reference to Judea and Samaria? Uh, very, very important because uh, I emphasize, first of all, the importance of territory for the protection of uh, the enemy potential. Now, regarding our own point of view, first of all, very simple from our own experience. It is a great difference to find yourself living in Shderot in five uh, kilometers from Gaza, getting less than 15 seconds if a rocket is launched upon you, what you can do in 15 seconds. If it is launched to Tel Aviv, it is almost a minute. In a, in a minute, delivering time to take to a shelter, take shelter, to do something. <laughs> and of course, it is time for all the Israeli protection uh, devices, the like uh, Iron Dome. So the territory is a great uh, functional uh, factor in just being related to the distance. As so long as the distance is greater, uh, the alarm is uh, giving more time, the preparation to prevent it is better, etc. You know, when people always say, well, you know, territory is not important because uh, we're exposed to uh, attack by long-range missiles, my answer is that because we're exposed 
to long-range missiles, we should expose ourselves to short-range missiles as well? Of Does course. No, it is combined, especially what they are asking. Okay, they are making a kind of a logical a, a argument by bringing a, the argument to absurdum. Yeah. What it means to ask us, okay, if what is necessary to protect yourself is to come to attack the places from which the rockets are launched, if they are launched from North Iraq, if they are launched from uh, Iran, will you come to take a, 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 in, with boots on the ground this position? If not, it means it is irrelevant. Absolutely, it is, a, again, a kind of demagogical argument. Why? Because long-range missiles are combined with short-range missiles. And if we are looking upon the narrow seashore of Israel, 60% of the Jewish people living between Netanya and Rishon Etzion, and if we will resolve from Judea and Samaria, they are not only under direct threat of short-range missiles, they are under direct threat of mortars and under direct threat of anti-tank missiles, as happened last Absolutely. engagement uh, in the main road from Yad Mordechai to Shderot to Be'er Sheva. Can we use a, a main road uh, six uh, exactly. that will be just located in the border, who can pr give protection to that? Nobody. And again, by just taking the example of Lebanon, the fact that the depth of the territory can create protection to the uh, assets of missiles of the enemy, it means that as long we will try to penetrate to Judea and Samaria that will be well protected in the same system as the protection that they created to Lebanon, we will have to direct our troops to offensive operation uh, through the huge cities, along the roads in the mountainary That's topographical really features, yeah. and it will be a very uh, not easy battlefield. What else is very, very important uh, to emphasize? I didn't mention the three factor, and they are using it in Lebanon by Hezbollah and in Hamas. The third factor is a strike by commando troops, and not one ter a terroristic attack. It is a, a mess of uh, battalions trained as commando, that in the first step, simultaneously with the rackets, are just uh, planned to penetrate the settlements along the border. Now, just imagine what could be the scenario. We are attacked by hundreds of missiles along all ranges, and simultaneously, we have to protect the settlements, not only kibbutz or moshav, it could be a city like Shlomi in the north, Metula, Nahria, Kiryat Shemona. What about uh, uh, the Judea and Samaria border? No, uh, uh, this potential could come to Judea and Samaria, and we will face attacks to Modi'in, Rosh Ha'ayin, Kfar Saba, Ranana, uh, who can deliver protection to that threat? Simultaneously with the northern threat is from in the north, IDF is uh, not really so big to supply uh, the protection to all these fronts together. One of the emerging threats also seems to be the development of drones. Of course, the, and this is also another impact of the postmodern warfare because drones you can buy them in eBay. Therefore, it makes the whole idea of demilitarized zone just an empty concept, because you can, in a way, uh, inspect a movement of armored division with radars, with other uh, sensors. You cannot inspect someone buying a drone and equipping it with a, a charge of TNT. Or worse, another a, a chemical charge. Yes, it could be everything. Uh, the variation is uh, going with the imagination. And here we can come to the second question, how we can explain that all the Israeli experts of security are falling to just look 
about this uh, potential of threat and ignoring it. Exactly. Uh, with this, particularly this organization called the Commanders for Israel Security with 300 generals. And, you know, I always wonder what military principle they're invoking because their, well, their, their suggestion of basically of unilateral withdrawal from Judea and Samaria means surrendering topographic superiority for topographic inferiority, for surrendering a straight short border of 100 kilometers for a contorted border of 500 kilometers, and for surrendering internal lines for external lines. So, so militarily, it doesn't make any sense to me. I, I wonder if you could say something about no, it. I think that it is a, a, an issue that could uh, give chance for dozens of PhD dissertations. It is a real question, and just to say that they are uh, ignorant or unprofessional, it is not really giving a, an understanding. And we want to get an understanding. How come that if they are real experts, how they are ignoring the new warfare uh, potential? Uh, and every time when I'm speaking, they are accusing me. 90%, 99% of all experts are thinking uh, against you. So I'm just uh, one uh, against all of them. I told them and Galileo was the same. And Schechtman that got Nobel Prize was the same. Uh, in the scientific endeavor, uh, it is not a democratic decision making that if all are voting against you, it means that uh, uh, you are wrong. But interesting, uh, you know, uh, Egal Alon, one of the iconic uh, left-wing figures of the Labour Party, also argued for the importance of territory. Of course, immediately after the end of the uh, independence war, after he finished as uh, the commander of the Southern Front, uh, the conquest of Elat, when they arrived to Elat uh, at uh, uh, March uh, 1949, he wrote a letter, uh, well argued to Ben Gurion, why we must insist to go ahead to take uh, Hebron Mountains, Judea and Samaria, because he analyzed the threat from the mountains. It uh, is a clear threat, and therefore along all the years, between 1949 to 67, the whole operational planning of IDF was that we ha don't have capability for defensive operation, and we must be prepared to a direct, immediate uh, offensive to the other side of the border because uh, in this narrow uh, seashore of 15 kilometers there are not at all necessary conditions for managing defensive operation, uh, uh, by no means. Well, so why so many former high-ranking IDF officials and security officials for territorial concession? You know, my, my feeling is that they're not invoking the security experience, the military experience, but they're venturing into politics where they have no real expertise. They are accusing me to speak political and they are, in a way, pretend to speak uh, professionally. And I'm saying, first of all, strategic questions, the strategic dilemma are always involved with uh, political issues. They are not just uh, pure uh, professional questions, but they are not really analyzing what happened since uh, the first days of Oslo Agreement in Gaza. They are not analyzing what happened with Gaza due to the uh, peace agreement with Sadat. And uh, they are not at all aware about the fact that most of leaders of Labour Party, including Shimon Peres, not only Igal alone, have been against the uh, peace agreement with Sadat because it demanded the uprooting of all settlements in Sinai. And Igalon and Yitzhak Rabin said that we are preferring not a peace agreement, but just a, a kind of declaration. Non belligerence. To make something interim and not final, and not to destroy the settlements, because they had a security function. If we are analyzing, what uh, afforded the Palestinian in Gaza to be equipped with professional missiles directly from Iran, coming from uh, Sudan to Sinai, it is due to the fact that not only we withdraw from Philadelphia, the border between Egypt and the uh, Gaza Strip, we destroy the settlements that could be buffer zone. With the settlements, uh, nobody could smuggle rockets uh, to Gaza. 
And in time of Mubarak... And the tunnels as well, I suppose. Yes, but in, of course, the tunnels, they cannot uh, uh, be tunnels of uh, uh, 20 kilometers. In time of Mubarak's president, uh, the Israeli Shabak gave all information about the smugglers to the generals, uh, to the in intelligence uh, of uh, the Egyptians, and they did nothing. Uh, and of course, the international force, the American force in Sinai, was not in charge to protect uh, uh, that uh, uh, threat. They are just uh, in order to inspect that the Egyptians are not making violation of the agreement. But it was a violation from a new kind, uh, of a new uh, logic, and they did nothing about that. So but tunnels. it means that if we would have the settlements there, the situation was different because we must keep a zone for isolation. And this is what's so necessary in the Jordan River. And I, I really wondering how course, a general like Gadi Shami, that was a former uh, central commander, together with uh, American General John Allen, prepared a plan that we will withdraw from Jordan Valley as well. And 380 uh, Americans will deliver isolation and uh, inspection that no smuggling of weapons will enter to Judea and Samaria. Beyond that, they are speaking about demilitarization regarding the concept and potential of threat of the last century. It means armored division beginning to move. It, if it is crossing the Jordan, of course, it is easy to get an alarm about that. Indications that they are doing that, you can uh, get it by sensor, by radar, by air uh, observation. But what about a Grad missile smuggled in a truck of potatoes through the bridges of uh, the Jordan. Who can inspect that? Even be beyond that, today everything could be produced uh, by themselves in the cities, in the same way that today with Iranian instructions, with civilian materials, with new systems of uh, uh, production, everyone can produce uh, excellent missiles at home. Why do these generals support us? What's, what's the motivation? Um, I, I analyze them by making a construction of four premises that they are taking in uh, the foundations of uh, justifying their attitude. I just analyzed four of these premises and I found all of them irrelevant and uh, disconfirmed by reality. And I'll just begin to uh, describe these four principles. The first pre a premise of them is the idea, it is of course a wrong idea, that was uh, again and again repeated by American ambassadors and others, like Martin Indyk, for example, good fences making good neighbors. It is true about John and Smith in Texas going on Sunday to the same church that they need good fence between them. We it, see that worked with the Hezbollah. It is absolutely not true between uh, enemies like Israel and uh, Hezbollah, Israel and Hamas. And we have a concrete example what happened since the withdrawal of the disengagement in 2005. I was a general commanded the troops to uproot the Jews from Gush Katif. I know exactly. And I told them what will happen. I told the general staff what will happen later after our withdrawal. And we build excellent fans, and is it really making good neighborhood? So this premise is just disconfirmed. The idea that we will make disengagement, uh, they will be there and we are here, is wrong because the fans doing exactly the opposite. The fans delivering Hamas, for example, protection uh, to build absolutely well-formed military organizations. They are not anymore just a group of terrorists. Basically, we have given them the freedom to operate unhindered. Of course, they have an institution of headquarters well-formed, command and control coming from that, battalions, brigades, a weapon systems a building. And beyond that, the fence creating a definition of casus belli. It means we lost the freedom of action. In Judea and Samaria, if we are entering night after night to Nablus 
due to information that we are getting that something is prepared, it is not a casus belli because there are not clear definitions of fence here and there that we are crossing a fence. So, so again, I, I repeat, what's, what's the motivation if, if everything... I mean, I'll just describe the premises. It means the first premise is disconfirmed. The second premise is that after Israeli withdrawal, the legitimation for the government to take decisions if something will go wrong, they are prem the premise is like that. The withdrawal will create new balance and even promote peace. But it is the premise that, in one side, the withdrawal will create an emerging better phenomena of peace, of, or if not peace, at least a kind of stability with a balance, that here and there will create a balance, and this will create stability, and stability will create peace. But the other side of that coin is that if things will go to the wrong side, then the governmental uh, decision-making will be very easy, because we did all our goodwill to withdrawal. Now we can attack. Why it is a disconfirmed uh, premise? Because we just got the evidence in the last year. Once it is exactly before Yom Ha'atzmaut. Once it is uh, in the time that we must uh, give attention to the first priority of the northern uh, threat, like yeah. the tunnels in the yeah. northern. It means that theoretically, it is easy to take the decision. Practically, with the circumstances, it is absolutely not easy. The third premise is that the IDF superiority is so dramatic that in several days uh, the IDF can destroy all the potential of the enemy and peace, or at least tranquility or stability, will come back to the region. It is wrong because the war will take not just a week, much more than that. We saw that in 2006 at the Lebanese war. It, yes, and it is not because IDF became uh, more and more uh, weak in comparison to the past. A lot of telling me, we are the heroes of 67. What we did in one day, you cannot do. General Jackie Evan, and he was a deputy of Sharon in crossing Suez Canal, told me, I, as a company commander in 1956, armor company commander, uh, made the whole uh, conquest from the north of Gaza Strip in uh, Bet Hanun to Rafa. I told him, what it is? A lesson? Today, not with Tank Sherman, with Merkava uh, 4, you will enter to the first street of Bet Hanun and you will not go to the other side. Because the threat is absolutely different. A lot of uh, uh, traps, a lot of snipers, a lot of uh, equipment, a lot. It is really changing. Uh, and it is not that IDF is not uh, brave as it was. It is that the circumstances of a battlefield are really uh, different. And we can uh, learn that from the Americans, that they lost more than 4,000 uh, good soldiers in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and the warfare in Mosul against ISIS, with American command together with Iraqi troops, Kurds. So Mosul compared to Gaza. And if we will withdraw from Judea and Samaria, the offensive will begin in Netanya to come to Nablus, or offensive that will begin in Be'er Sheva to come to Hebron. It is an operation of weeks and months not just several days. It means that the third premise is also disconfirmed. And the last premise is that due to the withdrawal, we will get a clear and absolute uh, international legitimacy to operate our forces. And we can ask again and again, after Kaslid, we got Goldstone report. And uh, after the last year, in every fighter engagement in uh, uh, the border in Gaza, uh, always inter international condemnation, not international uh, and commendation. We are invited to hug uh, civil yeah. rights uh, violation and all that. Yeah. Uh, 
crimes of war. This is what they are uh, claiming against them. War crimes, yeah. So um, all these four premises are wrong. So how they are ignoring that they are reading their wrong decision? Beyond that, they are telling me you are frightening the people. You are I'm scaring the people. You are telling them that they will be threatened by mortars from the Kalkilia, they will be attacked by anti-tank missiles. I told them, you are also scaring the people by telling that we will suffer from demographic threat, we will lose the Jewish state. And my answer is that I'm analyzing that through uh, the method of risk management. For me, the risk of staying in Judea and Samaria, even without uh, the autonomy that they have in uh, zone A and B. Today they have uh, absolute uh, autonomy. It means that 90% of Palestinians are controlled directly by a Palestinian authority, not by Israel. There is no occupation in Judea and Samaria since January 1996, and no occupation in Gaza since uh, May, June 1994. So even though they can threaten us by telling that they are giving back the keys and the Palestinian Authority will collapse and uh, vanish, okay? I prefer this threat upon the threat to begin a warfare from the narrow seashore in a situation that the main front in Judea and Samaria will be so close to the main strategic uh, centers of Israel. Okay, so I'm still wondering, you know, why, do, why do these generals hold these positions? And why do they hold the four premises that you talked about? Could be that they really lack imagination. Uh, one of my uh, duties as reservist today is to manage uh, the strategic exercises for the general staff and to territorial command. And of course, an exercise in, at that level requires imagination because I'm not just training them in what was already known. I'm trying to train them in what could happen. And also could be that they are not really learning the whole lessons of the last uh, experience of war in Donetsk, in, in uh, Ukraine, in China, the Chinese, how they are penetrating in the uh, uh, islands in the Chinese Sea with civilian uh, uh, fish vessels, fisher vessels, not just with uh, a navy. It means everything is hybrid today. They are not learning what made so many uh, troubles to the Americans, that they are the best army in the world. Why they are not uh, learning uh, the last eight years of civil warfare in Syria. There is a lot to learn from that. Did someone of them learn it? I think that they are not really uh, real generals that really like uh, the profession of warfare. And there is great difference between expertise in small uh, op uh, special forces low, operations low intensity and warfare. warfare. Part of the Israeli IDF uh, Excellency, and especially in the general staff generals, that they are coming from special uh, units, special forces, and all these uh, special operation forces uh, are really uh, dealing with uh, micro tactical uh, challenges. It is like a brain surgery. Uh, an expert of brain surgery, if he's coming to be a manager of a hospital is really irrelevant. Okay, thank you very much, uh, General Cohen, for your very erudite explanation of the uh, security and strategic situation of Israel. And I hope we'll see you back in the future for another edition of IISS video series. Thank you. Yeah.